how it. Okay. So you can't use Zoom. All right. Thanks. Bye. Um, okay. So Alan, I think you can start with your history, right? Okay. I will start with a little history. We'll talk about 2001. Um, 9 11, 2008. What was it? 2008. It was 2008. Sandy, Hurricane Sandy. Sandy was when? Like 13. No. Sandy was after that and today. Okay. Um, all right, I'll, I'll do a little opening for like one or two minutes. I'll try to talk a little bit about the history. Um, we could talk about opportunity, well, for brokers, you know, from building relationships and being a voice of reason. And also if there are consumer consumers on here, like the summer months, we should talk about that summer is seasonably slow, right? Summer is seasonably slow anyway. Um, you know, last few years, we're an anomaly, um, but we should also talk about that. Hey, listen, if you're looking to buy, there are definitely be opportunities because you know there's going to be less offers. Sellers may get nervous um, and less competition. Um, gap between sellers, yeah. So the big the, the the delay in like the market picking up is you know sellers kind of uh, realizing they have to lower the prices, you know, and how long will it take for them to figure that out or come, you know be okay with that. Um, we can talk about people backing out of deals, contingencies, um, high end and low end market. Um, and what else do we talk about? Opportunity, high end market, low end market. Uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about yesterday. Um, I mean, rental, the rental market is still very high, so that may help transactions. Okay, I'm just taking notes. Okay. That is great. Are you on? I don't see you on here, Alan. And then you were joining. Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Recorded in progress. Hang on a second. All right, we're on here now. Beautiful. I should clean up my office a little. We gotta finalize that picture for those guys. I've called Ricky up. I need to do that today. I gotta call. I gotta call uh, Barber, Ricky, and Jacobson. So we're doing this insurance. Michelle, do me a favor. I need to put this on firm letterhead. If you go onto the, if you go onto the F drive, yeah. just a bit letterhead. Mm -hmm. I want you to do letterhead, and then the other we just retype this letter it says so put this on. Okay. Copy the warranty letter to firm letterhead and sign the. Yeah, that's fine. Right. Just this thing. If I can find the firm letterhead with like my name on it, and then I'll I'll redo that one. That's the last one. Okay. Yeah, it looks great. It looks yeah, great. Thank you. That's awesome. Um,
going to do it. I had two people signed up. Right? 92. 92. Okay, good. We'll, we'll get Brian obviously involved. So we should really be asking questions. To, I should really try to ask questions to both of you. Or like, just to kind of, maybe that would be a better format. Um, just to keep getting you guys speaking and like between the, between the two of you, right? And I'll just throw out some questions and I could give some thoughts. 92 people signed up. Hello? Hi. I, I, I'm on your audio thing, but I don't see like me or like you talking. Or is there any closer? Uh, I don't see you on here. Attendees. Brian Scott, I'll get to let you in. Um, can you let Brian Scott in? Did you log on the way they told you to? Yes, I did. Okay, bye. 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 Rochelle, come over here a sec. Yes. So, There's some initial introductions. Um, what else can we talk about? People want to know where the market's going, right? People want to know where the price is going, where the future, the confidence of our city. I think having you and Brian on, you touching all the, you know, massive amount of transactions, Brian, the same, you both have a pulse on where the consumer confidence is, right? And so far the demand has been off the charts with low inventory. One will think that prices will maintain the same level. 
hard to imagine they're going to fall off the face of the earth with limited supply here in our city. I don't know if people hear us, so. He's already a panelist. He's, yeah, but he's not, he's an attendee. Well, his name there also. I'm on, but not seeing myself on video. Yeah, they just resent. Doesn't need to be on the call. Uh -huh. Rochelle, why are you asking? Mr. Cohen. Good morning. I am connected. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Hey. How are you? Awesome. How are you? I'm hanging, man. Hanging. Start of a nice long weekend. It's always a positive time, right? If you can't be happy now, when can you be happy? Get it for sure. You no, know, it's uh seems like the holiday started like for the last 30 days. <laughs> yes, yes, no doubt. Well, great stuff. You know, listen, prior to the last five years, we'll talk about this. We the summers were slow, activity was always very slow. Right, we just had the last five years where there were refis, purchases, the market was busy. I think it will go back to that for sure with, in terms of the pie, it's gonna get smaller for the summer, right? One would think. Yeah, yeah, 
Yep, yep, yep. It's not 2021 anymore, that's for sure. Right. But demand is demand is huge, right? Low inventory and huge demand. Have, have the numbers shown more inventory hitting the market each each week? It seems like it. From what I what I'm seeing, the answer is yes. We're starting to see a little increased inventory, and I'm starting to see people who've been looking the whole time get offers accepted. I mean, more more I'm saying in Westchester County than than other places where people have been looking. There's been no inventory. I mean, I have someone who got something accepted today that's under a million bucks, not a bidding war at ask with a contingency. I was like, whoa, and it's a nice house. I was like something, you know, that that's not normal, right? Normally it's like a couple people bidding war and they're asking 900 is going for, you know, 985 or something. And they got it for 900. And uh, there, so that, that, that's very interesting. Right. It's based on demand. There must not be enough other offers that the seller had no choice but to accept. You know, we talk about it all the time that contingencies aren't bad, especially if the LTV is low enough. Let, let's uh, wait a few minutes and everybody's listening, but let's wait till let's wait two or three more minutes and then uh, we'll get into the chatter. Hey everybody, let's give it a few more minutes to see a bunch of people logging on. We'll start shortly. All right, give it one more minute. I see a lot of familiar faces. Any names? Chat. Why wait for late people to roar promptness? That's a fair, fair question, Leanne. <laughs> though uh I, I don't know the real estate joke maybe five minutes late is on time um for some people let's see i think we're uh just had one more person pop on all right let's get started i feel motivated by leanne um <laughs> hope everybody is doing well uh five minutes early I, I agree with you robin i agree um so it, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces just to uh i mean we all know the zoom protocol by now but let me know if you uh want to chime in with a question or you can type a question to the chat um just a quick intro i'll let uh our friend brian introduce himself and then uh, we'll go around and then alan's going to give us a uh a little history and how kind of what we're seeing now relates to, you know, last 20, 30 years. 
Ryan, unmute yourself and give us a little background on yourself, and then we'll get into the, the dirty work. Sure. Um, I am a residential mortgage uh, person. I am work at Guaranteed Rate Mortgage. I've uh, been in the industry just about 18 years. Um, from New York, live in New York, office in New York. I'm on uh, in the West Village. I, um, you know, most of my business is condos and co-ops. Um, I do handle some stuff in Westchester, the Hamptons. Um, and thanks for having me today. Awesome. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Alan Perlowitz. Uh, Andrew and I are law partners. Uh, I'm a lawyer as well as a CPA. Uh, I've been practicing in our, in our city uh, for over 20 years and, and I've really seen a lot of different peaks and valleys, a lot of different waves. Uh, and it's, you know, it's always a challenge our city, whether things, the volume of activity is heavy or whether it's slow, uh, there's different nuances that go on, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's exciting times now for sure. Uh, and I am uh, Andrew Luftig. Uh, I help run our, uh, the firm's transactional apartment. So we're dealing, of course, with buyers and sellers of co-ops, condos, townhouses, every day, all day. Um, we have a seasoned team. We also represent a lot of the major banks in town, including Guaranteed Rate. Um, we do have a landlord tenant division, which seems to be a hot topic of conversation always. Um, rent guidelines changing. Um, notice provisions changing for free market rentals. Um, related to the residential world, we have a state planning division. You know, a lot of our clients uh, need trusts or wills set up uh, in connection with purchases or just you know, in connection with life. Um, deal with a lot of international clients, setting up different entities, um, LLCs, BVIs. We have an international group as well. And then we do a lot of commercial, right? Purchase, sale, leasing. So all transactional. We, we say we're lovers, not fighters, but as it relates to estate planning, real estate, residential, and commercial. Um, so Alan, uh, you've been doing this for a fair amount of time. Uh, tell us what you've seen and kind of your sense and your kind of calmness with what's happening now, you know, in relation to, you know, the history of our city. Well, I, I guess, you know, we, we, we could all start looking back that, you know, the first time that the city changed, let's start at 9-11, right? So when 9-11 happened, I can, I can remember vividly, the city just stopped transacting, probably for, and when I say the city, it's almost a tri-state area, but surely Brooklyn, New York, and the outer boroughs, there was no activity for five or six months. And before you knew it, in two or three months from there, within months six, seven, and eight, activity was almost back to normal, just because there was this period of six months where there was no activity and there was so much pent up demand. You know, if you fast forward to 2008, when Lehman crashed, it was a similar situation where activity slowed down, but we, we held prices. No, there was, there, there was no fired fire sale. There was no price reduction in a significant way. And as we, we continue through to Hurricane Sandy, and then even as we get through COVID, if you think about it, COVID slowed down demand. Prices kind of held steady. I don't think there were really any fire sales in our city, perhaps some commercial properties we were involved in. We saw some people kind of get some, some nervous feet. But for the most part on the residential side, from our vantage point, from our transactional team, activity slowed down but demand was still there. And we all know what happened from COVID to now, the demand was off the charts, right? And, and prices continue to rise. Right now we're in a situation where we, we're heading into a recession, rates are rising. It's hard to predict where the future is, but, but I think it's pretty, it's pretty comfortable to kind of feel that prices will keep there, keep their level, demand will slow down. How it affects where things go, I guess it's, I guess it's hard to tell. Um, I guess, Brian, give us a little thought you have on where, you know, the one question everyone on this call gets asked is, how's the market? You know, give us your state of the union from that perspective. Yeah, I can tell you, you know, on our end, what I'm, what I'm seeing personally and kind of as a, as a company kind of nationally, I mean, we're, we're, we've seen a pullback, right? It's, you know, don't read the news and I'm guilty of reading the news because everything on the news is kind of doom and gloom, right? Um, I'll tell you that, you know, locally in New York City and me specifically, we've seen a slowdown of number of people getting pre-approved by a large amount. This kind of happened starting in May, um, January, February, March, great, 
great business, busy, kind of uh, normal kind of overflow from 2021. I would tell you that April, we felt a little bit, but not much. And then May, we kind of all of a sudden had a little bit of a halt on the mortgage side where new applications were down to a 22 year low, actually. Um, Mortgage Bankers Association came out and said mortgage applications down 22 year low. And, you know, there's a lot of things that could be, you know, part of it. And, you know, even though that the market is changing, we're still seeing activity for sure. And, you know, before everyone got on this call, I was telling, you know, Andrew and Alan that I have somebody in, in Westchester County that got an offer accepted, like under a million dollars at ask, no bidding wars. And that, that may change after this call. The customer may be like, hey, Brian, I lost the property, but hopefully not. Um, but it's unusual. We're starting to see lower demand, but we're seeing more offers accepted, if that's kind of uh, a little bit weird. But we're seeing we're seeing less demand for sure. Uh, a big drop in the number of clients being pre-approved. We're starting to have conversations from developers, from you know, listing agents that are, hey, you know, what can we do creative to make this a little bit more attractive? It's either, you know, hey, can we buy a six month rate lock for our new development? Cause it's not gonna be done and everyone's afraid of what rates are gonna be. So we're having those conversations, um, you know, but look, you know, I don't know how long you guys in the call have been doing this, but you know, again, Alan, Andrew, myself have been here for a while. These are good rates is, is the bottom line. It's the way I look at it. And I try and tell people when you look at it, you gotta look at it as a payment, right? And versus just, hey, what's my rate? What's my rate? And, you know, there's a lot of different kind of loan options out there. And I think, you know, a lot of it is kind of in people's minds of, hey, maybe there's going to be a recession. Maybe there's not going to be, right? We, we don't know. One day I'm like, oh my gosh, the stock market's going down every single day. And then this week it's up. Well, three, three day, two or three days so far it's been up, right? Um, and then last week it was an up week as well. Um, I just think there's so many things going on and I'm a big proponent for buyers. Like if you see something, buy it, right? If rates come down, you can refinance. But that property you've been on the sideline for for a year because you got outbid, maybe now you have the chance. So, you know, on my end, I'm a big proponent of do it now. If rates come down, you can refinance. And we're seeing people that are now getting accepted offers that a couple months ago were not. I think we also need to realize that this is an intentional result of our government, right? This isn't, you know, this, this was, you know, created, right, by our government. It wasn't as if, you know, it does, it's different than a 9-11. Than a it's different than maybe perhaps a market crash or Hurricane Sandy. What's happening now was an intended result of, you know, our, our treasury and, and the government. So, it, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, we'll see how long it, it lasts for, but this isn't shocking. This isn't surprising. Um, this isn't doomsday, right? And, you know, there'll be a start to this and a finish. And, you know, we are in a market, right? Markets go up, markets go down. Um, and for you know anybody to expect them, we were doing, I think last year at this point, twice as many deals as normal for the prior six months. For a six month period, we did twice as many deals as normal. Clearly that's not sustainable either. Just like this won't you know, be sustained for, for a long period of time. Obviously, you know, no one has a clear idea, but um, you know, the summer, you know, just some you know, key points, summer is seasonably slow. Right, um, except for the last few years, so it's not it's not shocking. It kind of all comes together, right? We think about the summer interest rates, inflation, right? It, I don't want to say you know there's a lot of shifts, a lot of changes happening at once, so it, it, it's not surprising that we're having a slowdown or or a correction. Um, I think you know whether I see a lot of real estate professionals on the line here, and even you know buyers and sellers. For you know, real estate professionals, it's it's an opportunity, right? Anytime there's a change, you know, in law, a change in the market, you know, we view it as an opportunity to have, you know, to educate, right, the, the, the consumers. Right? That's why we're having this Zoom right now, right? You know, I related to when the mansion tax changes came about. You know, Alan and I were speaking in front of thousands of real estate professionals. We all, you know, were gasping for air. We thought it would, you know, kill the high end market. Um, and the high-end market, you know, after a week or two, it, it absorbed it very quickly. But my point is, you know, clients look at professionals, any professional as a voice of reason. 
to provide data information. You know, we are, I always say, ahead of you know the New York Times, right? We have we're live conversations. New York Times are typically, you know, or any you know, uh, newspaper, right? May have a certain opinion, may have information that was discussed weeks or months ago, right? It's not as prompt, it's not as timely. Um, so if you are a real estate professional, I'd reach out to your past clients, your current clients, prospective clients, and just, you know, speak with them, right? Hear what they have to say. You know, you're not promising anything. You don't have a crystal ball, um, but you want to give your thoughts and, you know, and what you're seeing in your office meetings, what you're hearing online here. And it's a great way to start a conversation, right? You know, many of you are so busy where you couldn't, you know, think about reaching out to new clients, right? You're just trying to keep up with your business a year ago. Now it's an opportunity to cast a big net, you know, with, you know, write a newsletter about what's going on and, and what your thoughts are, as opposed to, you know, the, the hot restaurant downtown. Um, and for buyers, right? Think about um, a lot of people are traveling internationally, right? Um, there are going to be less people looking at apartments. A lot of people may hit the pause button. So you may find those opportunistic, you know, deals, right? The sellers that get a little desperate, you know, come, you know, next week, you know, after July 4th, that, you know, things tend to slow down. Maybe there's a seller that has a life event that needs to sell, right? Cuts the price. And a lot of other buyers aren't so aggressive if you're looking. And even though rates may be a little higher than you like, you know, the, the, the discount in the price may be, you know, give you that comfort to proceed. So definitely, definitely give you opportunities in the next few weeks, next few months. Alan, you wanted to say something? Yeah, you know, one of the things I think the barometers I like to look at in our city is what I call like the consumer confidence towards real estate, towards residential real estate. And right now, buyers and sellers are trying to figure out where we go, right? Buyers feel that prices should come down and sellers are still on their high horse on what they've seen over the last three or four years. So I guess to, and Andrew and, and Brian, I mean, out of everyone in this city, both of you have your, your hand on the barometer. You're both touching clients on a daily basis. What is the confidence of people you speak to in terms of moving their families here, in terms of living here, in terms of being here? Because that, as long as there's confidence, we'll get a reset on prices as rates fluctuate and activity, there'll be a constant activity. We're going to reset the bar to maybe not the craziness, but there'll be a consistency that our city always gives us. But give us, let's talk consumer confidence a little bit. Yeah, I can tell you from our end, I think that, you know, and, and my end specifically, there's only one New York City, right? It's an amazing place to be. I think people still want to be here. Um, there's an article I read this morning about uh, about how New York City is, you know, basically back to, you know, how it's a safe investment, how it's back to levels, you know, 2015, 16 levels. Um, and it's an article, so I don't know the facts behind it. And, you know, I just stopped and thought about it for a minute. And I said, yeah, you know, people are nervous about other things in the market, right? They're not, I don't, I don't really hear people saying, oh, I'm nervous about the real estate value, or I'm nervous about, you know, what's going to happen uh, in other areas. It's more of world issues, right? It's the stock market. It's the word recession. It's the, you know, it's these CDC issues. It's Ukraine, it's Russia. It's not, hey, I'm, I'm concerned about New York City, right? And I think we've seen that time and time again as your 9-11 example. You know, I, I was, you know, I moved down where your office is, guys. I moved to, I moved to Gold Street down by South Street Seaport right off where your office is off John Street. I lived there after 9-11 and I, I moved because they were giving an incentive. They had a two-year lease deal uh, where they would give you, it was like a $12,000 credit or $500 a month for two years to kind of spur, you know, that kind of economy back up. Right now, like Andrew said, they're trying to cool down inflation and they're doing it, right? We're seeing it in some aspects, not all, right? Like we don't see it in gas yet, but they're working on it. We don't see it in food items. Like I have three kids. I still can't find like mini pancakes or shoestring French fries. Like these are, they, you can't find them. It's just the bottom line. It's super hard. So, but in real estate, in New York City real estate, I think people are very confident on New York City. So I don't see that being an issue right now. I think it's everything outside of real estate that's causing the impact is what we're seeing. And yeah, we're lucky to be in New York, right? Whatever what Ryan and Alan are, are saying, they're, Historically speaking, whatever the country's feeling, we feel it a lot less in New York, right? If there's a pause, 
you know, with 9-11, Sandy, and, you know, um, there were pauses for a year, you know, COVID, pauses for a long period of time. I don't have the percentage, but it's dramatically less in our city, right? The pause, the, the, the holdup. So we'll recover and we'll get back going a lot quicker than anywhere, anywhere else in the country, historically speaking. And I guess the big, you know, gap is when, you know, you have a seller, right? Their neighbor sold three or six months ago for $2 million, the identical apartment, right? Now, uh, a listing broker, you know, goes to pitch the apartment and it's, you know, they're saying, hey, listen, we should list it for one nine, one eight, right? And that $2 million number really, you know, two years previously was one eight, one nine, right? So the numbers are back to where they were pre-COVID or, you know, how do we, all of us as real estate professionals, convince sellers that, hey, listen, we have to, you know, come back to a different price and how long every seller's different will take sellers to understand and appreciate and, you know, deal with the emotional roller coaster and, you know, being obviously a bit upset um, to get, you know, the market moving again, right? The quicker that we can educate clients, that's why reaching out to clients is, is kind of in your own interest from a marketing standpoint, you know, business development standpoint, but also I think for all of us as real estate professionals, the more conversations we have with our clients, I mean, there are thousands of real estate brokers, you know, in New York City, we can actually have an impact on the market just by having these conversations on a daily basis, you know, having multiple conversations, um, you know, it'll kind of get, it's an emotional game we are, we're in. We all know that real estate is highly emotional. When I speak to clients, you know, an initial discussion, I use the, the phrase emotional, you know, I want to give you a comfort level, you know, three or four times. So how do we give them comfort to proceed? How do we give them comfort that they're making the right decision? that really, you know, yesterday's price, right, is no longer today's price. The, you know, the price has changed. You know, um, if guest history repeats itself, and we're starting to see it in, in our practice, people that are in contract are going to try to retrade the deal, right? There's a lot of nuances to existing deals, new construction deals. Let's chat a little bit about how can, what tools should we use to try to calm clients down and get people over the finish line because buyers will start to have remorse, especially on deals where they signed contract two years ago. It seems it could be underwater. Theoretically, the purchase price may start to come down a little bit. How do we manage clients? How do we, what's the thought process on that? It's hard. That's number one, especially with new development, right? Because you never know exactly when it's going to be done. Um, and a lot of clients who had opportunities to pay for a long-term rate lock opted not to. And now a lot of them wish that they did, right? It's, you know, hindsight's 2020, very hard to predict the future. And we're having this call right now in three weeks from today, the market can be completely different, right? And what's unique about now is that, you know, last time you had, you know, economic issues, we mentioned 9-11, mentioned 2008, rates in 2008 kind of all went down. So for, for me as a mortgage person, maybe you guys as attorneys, you were probably busy. And even real estate prices, um, I do a lot of stuff in Brooklyn and we do a lot of new development work. To sell some of these buildings, they cut prices from 800 a square foot at the time to 550 a square feet. And all of a sudden they started selling and flying these buildings that were you know, 50% uh, sold down, you know, 30% to 40% sold that we got, got up to 70% sold. So when the market changes, I think there's always opportunity. But I think in new development right now, I think it's hard, I think is the bottom line. I think that people should lock in and have the opportunity and pay the fee if there's a cost and they can do it for a long-term rate lock. Because if you lock a rate and they drop, you can always adjust it. But a lot of people who went into these contracts now, you know, the cost of money, it's a real number. And I think it's very different. And I think, so So just everybody on the, on the line, if you're in contract, you're a buyer, right? You want to renegotiate a deal. Number one, you know, the contract doesn't protect you, right? If you walk away from the deal, typically you'll lose your down payment deposit, your 10% deposit. So I think it's really also all about temperament. You know, do you have a nervous seller? Do you have an aggressive seller? Developers for new development deals tend to be less emotional, right? Because it's, it's dollars and cents. It, it's, it's a business transaction for them. Um, you may find if you're buying a resale condo or a co-op, a seller that's you know emotional, that's nervous about 
losing this deal, doesn't want to go back to the market, maybe they'll give you a, a 5% discount or maybe they'll give you some sort of closing concession. But it's very, very hard you know, to cancel a deal. You have to assume you're going to lose 90, 95%, if not 100% of your down payment deposit. Um, you know, the clients will look to brokers, you know, to reduce their commission. So if you're a broker on this line, and obviously we don't um, advocate for that and, and we, don't, we don't feel that's anywhere close to the right approach. But for real estate brokers, I see plenty of you on here. I would prepare for that conversation, right? I would kind of role play and expect the conversation with your deals and contract. Hopefully it doesn't come up, but you don't want to be, you know, shocked when it happens. You don't want to kind of be taken back don't be surprised, right? And it could be, you know, your favorite client that asks you to, you know, pitch in to get the deal done. Um, we have deals where if a buyer has the ability, think about this, it's actually interesting. Um, this happened right at the beginning of COVID. The boilerplate contract states that a buyer that's financing has 30 days to get a commitment letter, right? If there's a mortgage contingency of 30 days, normally 30, 45 days to get a loan commitment. Most people don't realize that if you don't get that commitment in 30 days, let's call it, the buyer doesn't have to ask for an extension. They can just ask for their money back. The seller doesn't have to give an extension. So there are a few contract provisions out there where, you know, if you just got the contract in the last, you know, 10, 20, 30 days, the buyer may try to get out of a deal. Another provision, if a co-op board hasn't made a decision within 30 business days of the closing date, 30 business days of the closing date, either party can cancel. Clearly sellers aren't canceling, but a buyer. So if you have a deal that's in contract and the co-op board is slow, check your dates because the buyer may be able to cancel the deal. Obviously they had to submit their board package on time. You know, they can't be in default on their own, but there's, um, you, I would say unique provisions or provisions that aren't really commonly thought about that may come into play in the next few weeks, next few months. Um, Brian, are you seeing any? Go ahead. I had a question for you. Are you starting to see either more mortgage contingencies or are you starting to see any kind of trend in contracts right now that maybe, you know? Yeah, I can look up, um, looking up our recent deals that aren't in contract. Uh, I'll tell you in a second. I think it depends on the market too. You know, we're finding a lot of deals over 5 million. We've got a bunch of townhouses that we're on and high end condos where they're not taking financing. And there, they're less interest rate sensitive. And that market's held pretty strong. You know, I know I see some questions coming from some folks as to seeing some price decreases in the suburbs. I guess as you get further away from our epicenter of the city, you know, the non-quality things will start to drop a little bit. There'll be a little bit, I don't know if it's off the cliff, but a little bit of a pull down. I think as Brian commented here in the comments, we're seeing, if anything, a leveling off. And some there's still demand for some quality product that's out there. So I don't think there's, it's just a question of activity slowing down. I think that we're seeing more than anything. Yeah, but to answer like your things. question, Brian, we usually see a third, a third, a third, like in a normal market, you know, third cash, third non-contingent, a third contingent. Half of our deals right now are contingent. So it's definitely, um, there are definitely more contingencies. It's not, you know, hasn't swayed. I mean, it's, you know, 33% to 50% is a, I guess a, a pretty big increase, right? Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're definitely seeing, you know, a change. But, but if you, you think get, about it, how often do you see a contingency where the buyer gets back the money? Like sometimes people get all crazy saying, oh my God, the deal's contingent. I want all cash. Brian, let's talk. I mean, if the LTV, if the, if the loan to value is, is 50 or 60%, if the appraisal comes in a bit low, which we should talk about what, what you're seeing there, the deal will still go forward. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, I have one more question too on that, but, for, um, but we can talk about that first. So I would tell you that it's a very, very, very small fraction of times where we're seeing people's loans don't work out and fraction meaning, you know, someone has, a, uh, someone dies. Unfortunately, we've had borrowers who died during the process, which is terrible. We've had people lose jobs during the process. Um, those are really the rare times that we see something kind of, you know, become an issue. We typically are not seeing an appraisal kill a deal, to be honest with you. I think that you agents on the phone are amazing and prepare clients, you know, hey, what if it comes in lower? Can you make up the difference? Or we're seeing those as no contingencies and they have parents or 401ks or things that they can dip in and kind of solve for it. 
And as a lender, we have options instead of maybe going 80%, maybe we have to give you 90%, right? So we have options. And I think doing the due diligence up front is super important when you're in that situation. Um, I think that kind of gives you an idea and kind of how to solve. And I always tell people going into it is, let's look at it because they would come to, you know, your attorney, they come to the mortgage person and say, Hey, you know, what are my risks, right? Like, Brian, can I go non-contingent? And we review it and we say, Hey, look, you can go non-contingent. You're super qualified with your job. Do you think you're going to keep your job? Right. That's number one. Number two is, you know, if it appraises less than the price, you know, what's your down payment? Is it 20%? Is it 50%? Is it 10%? The more down, the less risk there is. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I will tell you that, Sometimes the people, you know, even make me nervous. We had a deal a couple of weeks ago and they needed another appraisal. This is a crazy story that an appraiser missed a picture in part of the house and the appraiser was on vacation and they needed to send the appraiser back. So they had to get a new appraiser and the agents, you know, were freaking out and I a hundred percent understand that, you know, Hey, we shouldn't need it. And, you know, it appraised perfectly fine, but they were very nervous about the value. And a lot of times it's, you know, Hey, I get it, right? I live in a condo building in the West Village and I get a postcard every week, like record sale in your building, record price, you know, and you guys are doing great. But I think that, um, I, I think that just being prepared is the best thing possible, but we rarely see an issue with contingencies, very small fraction. How, what about on your end, guys, as, as attorneys, you know, uh, two questions for you on that part of it. Are you seeing people, you know, you mentioned new development. Are you seeing clients now asking about getting out, number one, on new development? And two, on resales, are you seeing people having second thoughts or more people who start the due diligence and are pulling back? We're not seeing it as much. Um, we, we, there's a little, little bit of chatter about it. Again, we're not in, you know, a market crash situation, right, where um, I have a broker calling me every day that's, he spoke, he's spoken to his client and the client hasn't reached out to me yet, which is a good thing, right? Um, talking about walking away from the deposit and you know entering the market in a few months, but that's literally 1%, right? Um, so we're hearing about it. I think we need to be prepared to be proactive and kind of you know strategize and how to have a discussion with clients, but it's, I'm not seeing it so much, very, very, very rarely. Robert, your question, um, how many of our deals are cash? So if we say 50% are uh, contingent, I'm just counting. About, yeah, I'd say the other, I'd say about 40% are cash and then 10% are non-contingent, give or take. Um, so there's a decent amount of cash. Actually, it's funny, you know, the cash deals, if I say usually it's a third, Interestingly enough, the cash deals, you know, are, are a little higher percentage than normal, which is, which is interesting, right? Well, I mean, I guess people that don't want to deal with rates or maybe go in cash if they have that ability. Um, but yeah, now that I think about it, I, I've been surprised to hear more cash deals recently. Um, I think you're starting to see people feel that, you know, real estate is a safe place to keep your money, right? So a lot less fluctuations right now that it's a, I mean, it's a good place to kind of park cash. So that, that, that makes sense to me. Any other questions, thoughts from our, uh, our audience? Oh, here, um, I have one more. I love three, pers uh, pers three things you'd say to prospective buyers and three things you'd say to prospective sellers. Um, this was from 1019. So I think, I think we've touched on some of them. I think for sellers, you know, kind of listen, the closer you can get in, the quicker you can get in touch with the reality, right? The better off you'll be, right? As far as moving your product, moving your apartment. Um, for a, a buyer that may say, listen, oh, I'm going to, you know, Europe for a week, you know, don't look, don't worry. You know, I'd say, listen, let's, let's be active. Let's be proactive. And, and I'll, you know, I'll be looking at the market and seeing what units are coming to market and seeing what price discounts we get, because this could be a great time to, you know, be an opportunistic purchaser. Um, Alan, Brian, will I read the next question? We're talking, we're talking about the 80% financing instead of 85%. 
I, I guess the, the concept is that if you have an you want to repeat the question now it's uh, a friend is selling in Long Island that suggested that she accept an offer on a 80 percent contingency instead of 85 percent I thought this would protect them against a possible low appraisal the contract came in and the writer specified that the appraisal had to come in at contract price so that that extra language on the appraisal coming in of contract price is not part of a standard contingency if the purchase price is a million dollars and the deal is contingent on getting an $800,000 mortgage, 80%, and the appraisal comes in a tad low at 950, all of a sudden it becomes an 85% loan to value and the bank will only lend 80% or 800,000, right? But it's the lower of the appraisal or the, the purchase price. So there they would get less money is what would happen. Everyone just follow that. So. Right, it would be 80% of 950, which would be less than the 800,000. But I think in general, it's lowering that contingency amount in the contract, but saying to the buyer, you can apply for more, but if the appraisal comes in less, you take some of that risk. A part of it is like deciding whether the buyer or seller will have the risk of the appraisal. Have we seen any appraisal issues? I don't think we have. Brian, have you seen anything of any significance? Not lately is the, is, is the truth. And I'm knocking on wood. I think this desk is wood, but not lately is the answer. A um, couple, you know, in Q1, yes, when things were going way over ask and multiple bidding wars and things like that. But we've seen, I, I personally have seen that calm down a little bit. Um, so lately, no. Good. And, and I think also we do have a lot of brokers on the line. I think, it's, you know, the creativity, creative broker, right? We always say that, you know, I guess probably the goal of all three of us on the line right now is to take a bigger piece of a smaller pie, right? You know, that to be more active, aggressive, and, and you know, um, the competition may be, you know, more fierce than before, but how do you as a real estate professional add value, right? Um, you know, think about your purchase CMOS, think about your 1031, think about, you know, how to negotiate a mortgage contingency where it's not, you know, 80% or nothing, where maybe it's bifurcated, the, the buyer takes the appraisal risk. So I think um, creativity and really, you know, the full sense of the term being a broker, brokering a deal, bringing two sides together, the reality is it may take twice as much effort to do less business, right? So again, it's, it's a more, it's a different market than it was before. So I think, you know, getting in touch with that and, and staying motivated and really brainstorming, being creative and, you know, instead of, you know, and taking a few hours to kind of massage a client may take, you know, twice as long and understanding that and, and accepting it, but, you know, really working to bring a deal together and in a hot market, right? You had an exclusive, you know, you had 50 people lining up outside the door, you had offers, you know, within 24 hours. And listen, in some markets, we're seeing that, you know, for sure. You know, I was just in a, in, in a Brooklyn office yesterday and a townhouse, they said that normally would have sold within a day or two. It took two weeks and it's a hot, you know, it's a, it's a great townhouse. You know, they were shocked there weren't offers in the first few days, but within a few weeks, you know, there were plenty of offers. Um, but the idea is, you know, thinking outside the box and, it, and if you're, you're a new broker speaking with your managers and how do you get creative? How do you add value? How do you you know, convince clients to, you know, uh, make, make a good decision or, or really educate them. So it's getting back to the basics, right. And knowing the game and knowing how to, you know, work with clients and work on putting a deal together. You know, we have to put deals together now, right. It's not so, uh, it's not a square peg in a square hole anymore. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Alan, anything on the commercial end that you're seeing that's... Uh... Yeah, I see I see a one question regarding a, a contracts and, and it's really for commercial and residential. You know, that's a negotiation to business point on COVID and future pandemics, right? What is the requirement for a buyer to move in if they're not able to move in? What's the requirement for them to close? We see it both on residential and commercial transactions and it's a negotiation between the parties. Uh, on trying to add language from the seller side that they have to close no matter what. And on the buyer side, if they're trying to get financing, whether it's contingent or not, there's a lot of issues where buyers say, listen, if I can't get financing because there's a new pandemic, then I shouldn't be forced to close. So, 
it's it's really a negotiation, I think, uh, on each deal, and that's that's how it's it's been working. I, I've seen for the most part. There's a question: How do appraisals track with market price? I think so far, Brian and Andrew agreed that appraisals have been coming in at the purchase price, at the contract prices for the most part. So that hasn't been an issue because prices have maintained the level. It's just the activity that we're seeing a drop in. Yeah, appraisers typically use sales that are, you know, obviously most, you know, closest to the subject property and the most recent. So the comps that have closed, you know, recently have been great because they went in contract 90 days ago, right? Right, so, right. You know, as a real estate agent, the hard part is now having the conversation to, you know, you know, maybe the market is changing, maybe not. Hopefully you can still get the same price as three months ago, but it may that could that could change, right? Because we're seeing less demand and we're starting to see offers come in. And you guys tell me, but this is what I'm hearing is you're starting to see offers come in now less than ask, where 90 days ago it started at ask and went above versus now people you know, are putting in offers a little bit lower than they've seen in the seen uh, recently. Are you, I don't know if you guys can type in the chat, but are you guys seeing, are you putting in lower offers if you're representing a buyer or as a listing agent, are you seeing lower offers? Can you type that in the chat, guys? Curious. There's been a mindset towards that, I would imagine, for sure. If we got nobody, <laughs> all good. Okay. Um, any last minute questions, comments? I think we're, I think we've kind of hit all the, the major points, but certainly stay in touch with us, you know, as uh, the summer progresses, if you have questions. Um, and I think, you know, like always, it's important to take a proactive, you know, last half full approach. Um, and listen, maybe use this as opportunity to, you know, attract more buyers. There's no question. Listen, they may not be buying today, maybe in a few months, but there's definitely, definitely an opportunity um, out there. Have a have a great fourth, everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye. Hey. Uh all right. So don't 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 you don't you guys why would you don't throw this back in his face? He said it. Okay, but so what does he want now? So break this down for me. So we need an electrician and a plumber. Yeah, so so the that, plumber is coming in today, right? The electrician. I don't think so. The electrician came in yesterday right. and last week. Right. And they're giving his proposal today. Okay. The well, plumber's coming in Tuesday, we think. In January. Okay. I spoke to Joe Bastone, and he's Who's with the that? expediters. And he said that the plumber got the certificate of insurance. So they are taking care of that. They came up with a plan exam. And once that gets approved, so then they basically. We given them any anything yet from the electrician or plumber? Have we sent it to him yet? We didn't buy anything like, like email, like a breakdown of what the work has to be done. And yeah, but he said there's some written from them. We don't have that. Hello. Yes, Andrew. Hey, it's Andrew Luftig and David Kaiser. How are you? Good. How are you? Oh, just dandy. This is fun stuff. Yes, it is. Um, so this is clearly a